This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. Uh, my name is Brian Provin Crane. I'm here today with Meher Roy. We're going to have Gavin Wood on in a second. Of course, Gavin Wood, who's done so much important work uh, around Ethereum, Polkadot, Parity. So we had a really fascinating conversation with him, actually. Meher and I both said this was, you know, one of our favorite interviews in a long time that we've done. Now, before we get started, actually, we, we did want to speak, uh, Meher and I did want to speak a few minutes about uh, a project we've been working on, a company that we started uh, at the end of last year called Course One. Uh, we haven't really mentioned that so far, but this has kind of been uh, our, our main focus since then. And what we've been doing is, you know, we've been building validators and kind of staking infrastructure proof of stake networks. So also some slight disclaimer, really. I mean, we haven't yet worked done much work on Polkadot, but it's definitely one of the projects we're very interested in also working uh, at it from, from that end. So we have this, you know, kind of relationship uh, also from that end. Yeah, and it's actually been fun working on building a validator. I feel it's making me a better interviewer because for many of the projects, I... I'm starting to know the internals of the projects much better. So I think, I hope it will be a positive sum game with Epicenter and the viewers will get more insightful questions from the two of us because we have this experience with Chorus One. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think that was also one of the things with me that really attracted me about it is that, you know, we've, we've had so many conversations about so many different projects and have this, you know, fairly superficial knowledge of like, a ton of different things going on. But then when you actually try to build, you know, this fundamental infrastructure that will make a blockchain work and, you know, actually make it secure and sign blocks, that's very interesting to think uh, also, you know, sort of look under the hood. So that's also been one of the things I found really fascinating about it. But I'm sure we'll talk more about that at some point in the future. Now, there's one other announcement that we briefly wanted to make. So this week, actually, you know, DEF CON is going on in Prague. Uh, Sebastian is in Prague. I am in Prague. Unfortunately, Meher, you can't make it this year. Uh, but, you know, we have a few other people. Uh, Sonny, I'm not sure if he's here. But uh, so we are organizing a, a meetup. Uh, and the meetup is going to be on the 31st, uh, around 7.30 to 9.30. So hope to see many of you there. If you want to learn more about it, just go to epicenter.tv slash DEFCON4. That's D-E-V-C-O-N-4. And, you know, you can learn about the details there. And I hope to see many of you there. And now let's, let's go to the conversation. Hi, so we're here today with Gavin Wood. Gavin has, uh, you know, we've known him for a long time. Actually, I was, was looking back just earlier and he was already a guest. It was episode 31. So that's over four years ago. And I remember recording that in Gavin's apartment just briefly after he moved to Berlin. So that was before Ethereum had launched, much before Ethereum had launched. I think it was just around the time of the Ethereum fundraiser, during the Ethereum fundraiser. So one of our, you know, one of our very early episodes, pre-video and a uh, long time ago. Of course, Gavin's done a lot of, you know, important work in the blockchain space. He joined the Ethereum project very early on, uh, kind of at the very start. He wrote the yellow paper back then. So that was kind of a technical specification of Ethereum. And uh, he built, you know, he was the guy who originally developed Solidity and uh, the C++ client. And then, of course, went on to do a lot of a lot of other important things, including uh, founding Parity, and and now uh, Polkadot. So there's lots to speak about. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on today, Gavin. Thanks for having me, Brian. So, first of all, tell us a little bit. Like, how did you originally learn about Ethereum and blockchain and get involved back then? I guess I, I guess it started um, in. 2013 really um I, I was aware of bitcoin a couple of years before when it first hit slash dot um but i don't know it, it kind of 
didn't seem particularly interesting, kind of pointless bottle top currency. You know, I think I was um, in the not not in a minority in basically writing it off as an irrelevant experiment. Um, and a couple of years pass, and it's like early 2013, and I see this you know, these stories about the Silk Road, and I see you know stories about how you know Bitcoin's being used as um, you know to facilitate this this stuff. And it's uh, you know it was like wow this is I mean there are people using this that that was a that was the first kind of surprise it's like wow um, and I I sort of kept an eye on the stories and I found one guy um, whose name is Amir Taki and uh, you know he this this guy seems to be kind of a revolutionary a kind of crypto programmer you know cypherpunk kind of revolutionary guy so um, I figured he was an an interesting kind of guy to uh, speak to so I I reached out to him. I'd done a lot of uh, coding in the open source world for the, I don't know, 10 or 15 years before. Um, and I, I had an email address that sort of demonstrated this. I have like a, a kde.org email address from the times that I was a KDE coder. Um, and I knew Amir would recognize it. So I, uh, I used that and, lo you know, sure enough, he replied. And he invited me to his squat, um, the same one that I'd seen him being, being interviewed in, um, which was kind of interesting. So I got the train down to London met up with him and I met up with a couple of his friends as well. Um, one of them was uh, was Mihai Elisi, who um, I, I actually randomly <laughs> said hello to him. Uh, Mia sort of threw this door open to one of the rooms in the squat and uh, Mihai was there in bed with his girlfriend, Roxana. Um, and uh, and he was like, oh, this is Mihai. He does Bitcoin magazine. And I was like, hi. <laughs> and Mihai was like, hi. And Roxana was like, hi. <laughs> and uh, then he closed the door. <laughs> it was kind of an odd, uh, an odd kind of scene. Anyway, we, uh, he also introduced me to another guy called Johnny Bitcoin, um, uh, Jonathan James Harrison. And he was uh, kind of man about town in London. He had a bunch of friends and he'd been staying with a bunch of people in um, a place by Barcelona. Uh, where he met uh, Vitalik and um, he'd been chatting to Vitalik about what he was thinking and this was kind of pre-Ethereum but not long after Vitalik um, started sending uh, sort of early versions of the Ethereum white paper to uh, various people in his um, email address book and one of them was uh, Johnny Bitcoin and uh, when he found out about Ethereum he sort of thought it was kind of a cool idea and he mentioned it to me in one of our sort of times down the pub having a, a pint together and he said, look, if you're, uh, I, was, I was kind of saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm such a good programmer. Um, and he was like, well, if you're such a good programmer, you should just go and program Ethereum. And I was like, fine, I will do. So I, uh, <laughs> I downloaded this white paper and I, oh, I think, I think even Johnny sent it to me. Um, and he made the intro with Vitalik. So I, I started chatting to Vitalik. And um, yeah, it, it was, I was working at some like really boring, horrible Microsoft coding at the time. And, um, and I, I just wanted something to clear my mind over Christmas, kind of a nice little project. And uh, this seemed to fit the bill. So I, I started coding up uh, Ethereum and before long, I was sort of uh, swept away into this, this new world. And so what was it about Ethereum that, you know, kind of captured your imagination when, you know, Bitcoin hadn't done the same thing? I think, I mean, there's a, there's a few kind of points, I guess. One of them was that you know, I kind of knew roughly how blockchain worked, but I, you know, I kind of learned things by implementing them. And um, it seemed that Ethereum was a more enjoyable, a more pointful thing to implement than Bitcoin. It's like, why would I, you know, why would I implement something that's already got like two or three implementations that are perfectly, perfectly good enough? Um, Ethereum was relatively nicely specified. I mean, it turned out that there were quite a few um, holes in the specification, but it was it was good enough to get going, and that was that was just nice. That was that was a nice, clear um, kind of um, little coding mission to go on, um, and I was also curious um, to see how well it would work. Um, it's you know it was doing stuff that hadn't been done before, and um, I I was pretty sure that it wasn't going to work, but. I figured that with enough tweaking, it might eventually, um, it might eventually do something kind of interesting. It wasn't until later that I really kind of got to grips with what Ethereum was and 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 why it was um, sort of you know so um, so sort of special.
So you said later you realized, okay, Ethereum was actually so special and it took you a while to come to grips with what it was. So like, tell us about this. Like, what is this essence of Ethereum that it took you some while to understand? Um, I guess it was um, sort of fast forward a couple of weeks and I'm, I'm in, I've been implementing this, you know, I don't know, for four weeks or so. And I get, I get sort of noticed that, you know, we should meet up in Miami, everyone's getting together. Um, it's meant to be a hackathon, you know, we're meant to sort of all get down and start, start coding, uh, um, well, finish coding Ethereum. Um, it turned out that I was actually the only real coder that was there. Um, everyone else was sort of busy uh, doing other stuff. And it was during that time in Miami that I sort of got thinking about, I was exposed a lot more, let's say, to the Bitcoin world. I was exposed to many different Bitcoin people. I was exposed to some very interesting people, some sort of uh, self-declared philosophers and, and, and so on. And we, got, we had a few interesting conversations. And some of them got to the, sort of talking about the state of, of, of the crypto world, um, how Bitcoin was cryptocurrency and things that were sort of crypto finance were coming out. Mastercoin was uh, fairly um, in vogue at the time. And uh, there was an idea that Mastercoin was providing financial contracts on the blockchain that was going to you know, facilitate this whole new wave of crypto finance, lending and, and, and contracts for difference and all sorts of things like that. And, um, and I was trying to figure out what, what Ethereum was, you know, if, that's, if we've got cryptocurrency and crypto finance, um, is Ethereum just another crypto finance? That's how it was kind of presented to a large degree in the white paper. If you read sort of the original um, white paper, it, it had a little bit to do with sort of smart contracts, um, but a lot of the, the general sort of gist was, um, was really kind of a, a better, more Turing complete, better scripted version of Bitcoin. Um, there wasn't really this idea of building um, cohesive decentralized applications at that time. It was it was very much coming from a, a sort of nuts and bolts purist. We're making a smart contract platform. We're making a, 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 mecha, a platform for, for for deploying and executing smart contracts. And um, it was it was sort of at that time that I was uh, I was thinking, well, what what is this platform? What does it do? What's the general generalization of it? And um, yeah, it was there that I sort of figured, well, this is kind of crypto law because what we're doing is we're creating new laws. They're laws because we can't work around them. They're, they're, they're laws like the laws of nature. They're, they're just there. They're, they're sort of set by game theory, but they're different to laws of nature in that we can kind of program them ourselves. Um, and that was very interesting. And it was like at that point that I started to realize, you know, the vastness of, of what this what this software would change. It was going to really going to change the way um, that society was going to basically work. Um, it was going to provide a whole new sort of economic um, foundation for society. So you, you mentioned another thing that you learn by implementing. Is, uh, is that a habit you still continue? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's um, you've got to balance it with some forethought, especially when you're doing things like design, um, like protocol design, and um, particularly kind of where the stakes are high, it's important to think through and prove things. But in general, I find that um, I can I can deal with things a lot better. Um, I can internalize them, if you like, in my brain. I can understand them a lot better if um, I work through and I code them. And the thing is, if you code it, it's basically just formally and, and um, strictly expressing what it is. It's not, it's not really doing much more than that. And it forces you to really uh, manage all of the sort of edge cases, all of the, um, all of the, the, the sort of corners that you might not think of when you're sort of considering the general vision or the sort of direction that you want to move in. Um, and it's very easy to sort of Think of an I think you know get a concept get an idea of something and think that you've designed it through think that you've you've got it all covered and then when it comes to coding it it doesn't compile or you can't code it in the first place and when you realize um, why it doesn't compile it teaches you about why your idea maybe isn't as good as you thought it was or at least isn't as complete as you thought it was interesting so would it be right to say that 
you're you're not somebody that reads a lot of white papers necessarily uh, you get inter- I mean. interested in in an idea and you maybe write your own paper and you build it yeah i i don't know i i, I kind of i remember um reading you know a quote by someone that was basically like um you know it's important to stand on the shoulders of giants but also eventually um it's similarly important to um kind of keep saying keep saying and and, and sort of arguing um new things things that just seem correct to you um from first principles and eventually you'll start arguing or or discovering things that no one else has has argued or discovered before and that that kind of that second part really definitely sort of appeals to me i'm not i find that if i read too much it's it's very difficult to it's kind of like you'll get led on down a particular path down to a particular way of thinking or way of considering a problem and it it shuts off kind of psychologically speaking other paths um and i you know i can see the balance of like well you know if it's already been determined that that's the correct solution that's the optimal solution then you know you shouldn't try and reinvent the wheel you should you should just follow on and build on it but similarly in these very um sort of early stage industries where lots of ideas are floating around um believing that something is the optimal solution and just sort of automatically using it or automatically assuming that that's the case i think is is uh, can be hugely problematic and so i don't I kind of I like to chat to people because about new things because in that case it's very easy to kind of um delve to the bottom of something and you can better understand whether it really is sort of the best way of doing something you understand the trade-offs perhaps that were made you can challenge um but that's not the case with a white paper and white papers are often written again like as i mentioned before the design of something they're not real implementations which means a white paper might on the surface seem as though it's delivering so many things it's it's the you know it's the best thing since sliced bread but actually when you get into the nitty gritty there are all sorts of corner cases that you don't think about because they're not presented to you in the white paper um but it means that it's it's actually not the optimal solution and it's maybe not even a good solution so i could i could see uh, this approach working when let's say like you were an individual contributor right so you would maybe you're doing your phd then you'd build ethereum and um has your approach changed as you have so now you're also managing this organization and presumably there's like lots of other people that are building the same have you had to change in your approach on on how to learn to manage an organization a team of developers not just yourself yeah so thankfully um thankfully i don't have to do management i i kind of managed to <laughs> sneak out of that one um <laughs> it's definitely not my favorite thing um and my uh, my role within parity is um i'm a basically a team lead um i'm the one that sort of tells people look you really need to review these prs um i'm the one that sets the milestones and i'm the one that sets the white space policy which is i can't tell you how important that is um but i'm not the one that has to um sort of manage per se like management comes with quite a lot of other things that are that are non-technical and uh that's something that i've i've stayed um well out of um the the closest thing i do to management is that i i interview people um so to to you know if they want to come work in the team um but beyond that it's very much a the same open source mentality that we've had and that I've been sort of involved in for 15 20 years now and um I don't think I mean you know it's evolved of course we have new tools we have github we have pull requests but basically it's um it's still just being a a programmer and um uh, that's that's kind of what suits me the best and there are people who are better at doing things like management and doing things like organization building and that's good because um, they can take on those roles if you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers 
Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. So speaking about organization building and management, so of course you, you did uh, work for Ethereum, right? So you were a CTO of Ethereum, but then you know pretty soon, I mean, I think the Ethereum uh, organization went into many different directions and, and it kind of spun out a bunch of different organizations, but one of them was, was yours. So first was called ETHCore and afterwards Parity. So w when you started Parity, what was the vision for Parity, uh, both in terms of, I don't know, the, what kind of organization you wanted to build, but also what kind of you know, impact you wanted to have with Parity? I think it would be fair to say that some of the early days with, with ETHCore, Parity, were, um, were pretty, pretty muddled. There was one guiding light, which was, um, let's build an Ethereum client. Let's, let's do this from the, from the ground up and let's kind of see where this takes us. That was, that was what we did. Um, there was beyond that so when we're talking like kind of um business plans and marketing and all that sort of stuff we there were lots of ideas floating around but um to be honest we didn't really know it was a very i mean you know this is late 2015 early 2016 this is uh the industry was kind of crazy lots of things coming in there was the dow going on there was I don't know, uh, teams sort of coming in, there was a whole um, ICO thing happening. It was, it was a very like generally um, uh, mad uh, time. And there were lots of things sort of pulling at our, our, our sort of attention. There was the idea of what about enterprise blockchains? What about, you know, uh, building stuff for, um, uh, for companies? What, you know, Microsoft seemed to be coming in at the time with the sponsorship of the uh, DEF CON 1. Um, there was also the idea of, um, you know, sort of building out Web3 and like, what, what if we did Swarm and Whisper and we put it all into a browser, you know, well, it wasn't clear that Mist was, was sort of uh, being developed um, um, at a substantial rate. Um, so there was, there were lots of ideas, there were lots of potential directions. Um, and in the end, we, we just basically stayed true to our developer culture which was, let's just build stuff. Let's just start with building what we know how to build. We'll start with building Ethereum. We'll do it right. We'll do it in the way that, we'll architect it in the way that we think is is um, is best from the ground up and, um, and see where it takes us. And I think, at least for me, it was probably not long, four to six months into the, having the company, um, where... I started to realize that the company I wanted was very much a technically focused company. So um, kind of until then, you know, I was kind of half buying into a lot of these Silicon Valley self-help books where they're like, oh, you know, you need to think about marketing and you need to think about um, company building and you need to think about sort of, I don't know, um, uh, you have to have these particular points of culture and you, you, it kind of gives you all of these um, many there are so many of these books and they give you all of these sorts of um, bits of guidance uh, rules to follow and I kind of the idea of building a company who's um, that was really just about being deliver developing and delivering um, the best technical solutions without having too much of a consideration for um, some of the other aspects, um, particularly around marketing, um, was almost kind of a, a dirty, a, you know, it's kind of like the thought that dare not share itself. Cause I, I you know, I figured that that was just gonna be, that, was, that, that wasn't following the rules. It wasn't following the advice. 
Um, that wasn't what the company culture was allowed to be. But it, it turns out that that very much is what our company culture has, has, has become. Um, and I think that's, you know, a lot of that is down to my sort of influence. And, um, and we really do have a sort of developer driven mentality within parity. Um, and marketing and business development and product, um, I wouldn't say is necessarily sort of lagging far behind, um, particularly product. We do have a fairly um, sort of, um, we try and do product development as part of software development. But, um, but I would say the biggest part of our attention falls on, um, falls on making you know, really great software. And, um, and for that matter, really great platforms for, for, for building software. And that's, um, that's really enjoyable. When you're driven from this kind of technical standpoint, it makes development so much faster because you know what, you have a sort of innate idea about what it is that you want to get done. Um, you have a very sort of clear and concrete vision. It makes product, it makes product development, it makes project management um, so much easier than in the early days where, you know, you're trying to be very much more market led. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's substantially uh, more difficult to work with as a developer. So I, I clearly remember like, so um, I, I saw posts around the formation of parity and I think the first target was to build a client for Ethereum. And my, my, my first question in my head, head was like, who's going to fund this team? Because like, who's going to fund the, the building of this company that builds a client for Ethereum? And then like a few months later, you did raise your first round of uh, 700K or something like that. Um, so you threw out like at least parts of the Silicon Valley playbook. Your first product wasn't something that would generate enough money. How did you, did you not struggle to raise uh, money and get the company going? I wouldn't say struggle, but it was not, it, it wasn't something that we were going to get tens of millions for. I mean, at the time, um, we were seeing uh, R3 start to raise crazy amounts. We saw 21 raise a huge round. Blockstream raised a huge round. Um, and I think, uh, uh, what is it, Digital Asset Holdings, was it? Um, Live Masters um, thing. Uh, they also had a, a pretty big raise. So, you know, there were people who were raising really you know, huge amounts of cash for, in principle at least, blockchain. Uh, blockchain-based products. Um, I mean, R3 sort of steered away from it in the end, but that was its um, original suggestion. And I think, um, you know, we kind of considered ourselves to be more or less of the same sort of class. Uh, we were we were developing, you know, sort of next generation blockchain. Um, and in my mind, we had the better technology. So I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't like, super um, worried that we were kind of on the wrong path. That said, we weren't, um, we weren't industry heavyweights. I mean, Ethereum was still down at like 80 cents or so at that time. It, you know, it was, it had gone up, what, 2x, 3x more or less from, from the sale, but like no one really cared. Um, and so, yeah, it was, we, we didn't really have any huge amount of credibility. People could see that there was a platform behind us, but there wasn't that much um, uh, doing with a platform. Uh, Bitcoin was still very much king. And um, yeah, I, it, it wasn't, thankfully, you know, we had some people that did kind of believe in, in Ethereum, if you like, or believe in the platform. Um, and they were, um, they were very quick to, to get us started. And uh, you know we did we didn't we we didn't really kind of do the whole Silicon Valley thing of going around all of the things and having a pitch deck and having a really kind of um, uh, slick you know product slides and we we were like look we're going to make an Ethereum client we think Ethereum's probably going to be significant uh, we think it, it may well end up being the platform of choice for anyone who develops on blockchain. Um, this could be a sort of enterprise play. This could be an open source 
um, sort of user-based play, um, we don't know yet, but you know, we think it's probably worth doing. And um, yeah, a few of the, there were people who, who sort of said, yeah, cool, we think you're a good team and we think you'll, you'll sort of be able to take it somewhere, um, which was cool. And I think I've grown kind of, having seen Silicon Valley up close and personal, um, the show uh, that, that, that based itself on it is actually pretty true to life a lot of the time. It's really not, it's a bit of a club and it's a bit of a, the, there's a certain talk, you got to kind of talk the talk um, <laughs> to be accepted sort of as a potential member of that club. And, you know, we were never really a talk the talk company. We were a build, we were a get shit built company. And that's, yeah, I kind of go grow a little bit kind of, um, what's the word? Um, not disappointed, but um, I, th I think Silicon Valley thinks more of itself, but has a higher opinion of itself than it deserves, let's say. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, it's, it's also interesting you know, that you had like Ethereum and, and nobody in Silicon Valley cared about Ethereum. And then it became this massive success. And then and it was this entire thing, right? That basically the VCs in Silicon Valley sort of like, you know, missed out on. And then of course, now there is this huge uh, tendency with VCs, right? They're like, okay, no, we missed Ethereum. So now we're going to have to fund the next Ethereum, right? And it's like, so it's interesting how this, um, yeah, how this sort of played out. But let's speak about Polkadot. So, so afterwards, right, you build Parity and then and Polkadot has become this major thing uh, or, you know, major focus of yours. So how did the, the genesis, what was the genesis story of Polkadot? So rewind to 2016. We've been working at Parity for about six, seven months. I think we began, um, we began coding the Ethereum client late November-ish, 2015. And uh, yeah, it's like June, July, August. I can't remember exactly. And, you know, I'm sort of, we're kind of waiting with bated breath on Ethereum one and a half or Ethereum two. We're kind of, you know, kind of waiting for this sort of new white paper to come so that we can, we can start implementing it. And um, basically there were a bunch of things that happened. Uh, there was the DAO that kind of stole some attention. Um, from the core development team. And there were a few other kind of bits and bobs. And, you know, we started to get a bit kind of, hmm, is this ever going to come? And so just on a sort of an off chance conversation with, um, with Marek, one of, our, one of the sort of um, kind of founder developers of, of, of Parity, um, while we were in uh, San Francisco, we started, well, Marek just sort of said, well, what if we sort of built something like that ourselves? Would it, you know, could we, could we do it? I was like, well, I started to think about a design for a sharded version of Ethereum that was as simple as possible. That kind of, I'd already come up with this I, this notion of chain fibers, which was back in 2014, and that was also a kind of sharded Ethereum, but it it tried to keep the original Ethereum um, sort of ease of development of smart contracts, and particularly how smart contracts can talk to each other. And as such, it, it's kind of um, it's substantially more complex. Um, so I kind of thought, what if we could, you know, let's let's forget trying to make it as Ethereum uh, as, as as transparent as possible over for developers, and let's say, right, well, we're going to change some of the some of the assertions and assumptions that developers can make. Uh, maybe it's not going to be quite as easy to develop upon, but let's try and make it as simple as possible. And um, that was basically where the original idea of Polkadot came from. Um, it it was essentially, you know, can we parallel? Can we create a sharded Ethereum? Following from that, like pretty much in the same conversation, I think we were having a beer at some bar, and uh, after we met met a VC maybe in in San Francisco, and it was it was there that I realized that you need this kind of you're going to need a kind of I think Ethereum calls it the beacon chain. Uh, but you need this. You need a sort of main chain in order to validate all of these shards to make sure that they're not doing anything that they shouldn't be doing. And it was always in in my mind super important that the shards should all have the same guarantees of security. So this is different to some of the early things that Vitalik was saying. He was in the early days. He was a favor of different shards having different levels of security. Um, and it's also dissimilar to some of the other 
um, uh, multi-chain designs um, like uh, Bitcoin side chains and Cosmos where you know you can have different sets of validators for the different um, sub chains um, in my mind that, that you know they always needed to be the same the same sort of security guarantees and so um, it was one way of doing it and the obvious initial um, thing to do is just to fix it hard code it hardwire it to be um, for that validation um, algorithm that 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 that, that Thing that's running, checking that all of these different shards are doing the right thing, um, was to be just Ethereum, right? So the shards are all basically implement little bits of Ethereum, and and the main beacon chain or the main uh, relay chain, as we call it in Polkadot, um, is is checking, um, making sure that they're all doing the right thing. But um, then I figured, well, what if we let the chains do different things? I mean, it's, there's no real need to fix them all to be doing the same thing. And as long as you make the message format that's being passed between them arbitrary, like kind of just general, just a bunch of bytes, basically, um, then there's actually no, no need whatsoever to, to be, for them to all be the same. And that's where the idea of a heterogeneous multi-chain came from rather than the homogeneous multi-chain that is Ethereum 2. Um, and... It was, again, not much later still. I think it was a, maybe a couple of weeks later. But at that point, I was like, well, hold on. We've got this kind of platform called WebAssembly. And WebAssembly lets you basically describe any program. You can compile many languages to it. Um, it's just a sort of gen generic abstract um, um, uh, machine specification. Um, and it's nice and simple. Why don't we just encode this validation function um, that could be different for each of these different shards? As, uh, as a WebAssembly program. And then they can just be linked, they can just be uh, sort of executed, and you can store what the, um, the, the software to actually validate these things, or indeed the specification, the definition of a, of a valid um, 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 a parachain or shard, you can store that on the relay chain itself. And so now what you have is this kind of completely generic mechanism for um, bringing together many different shards, many every different chains that all have their in individual kind of niche or individual, um, um, well, we call it a runtime. Technically speaking, it's a state transition function. But basically, um, I like to think of it as like the nature of the blockchains. Like Bitcoin has a particular nature. It's to do with unspent transaction outputs. It's a very much a currency chain. Ethereum has a different nature. It's a smart contract chain. So you can actually define chains of various varying diff kind of different natures and they can all sort of exist within this community um, where they're all being secured with the same apparatus and they're all able to pass messages between each other. And so it kind of evolved basically from a, how would we scale Ethereum to why don't we, um, why don't we actually implement this? Because it's doing, we didn't really want to kind of jump the gun, so to speak, um, but it seemed a lot more reasonable to implement something that in and of itself was going to be a, um, a, a sort of a next generation play. Very interesting. So I, this prog progression of ideas is really nice. So like Ethereum, okay, then we need a sharded Ethereum. Oh, then we'll need the central chain to be the arbitrator of final validity of some kind. Then like the idea of oh, the, in these para chains or these side chains, they should be heterogeneous. And of course now if if they're going to be heterogeneous, then you need some way to distill and express their difference in like one common in one common manner, right? And so that leads into you picking like WebAssembly and allowing these chains to allowing like the state transition functions to be written in in WebAssembly. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm curious like why you picked WebAssembly in particular. Did you have some other choice that you did not, uh, some other road that you did not pursue? I mean, in principle, there were a couple of potential candidates. Um, the most sort of obvious one, I guess, is LLVM's IR code. So LLVM, if you don't know, is a, um, a compiler uh, framework. Um, it lets you um, 
uh, sort of uh, not have to write half of the compiler if you want to make a new programming language. Um, you only have to write the bit that um, basically just passes your, your program and, and specifies um, um, in a machine independent manner what your program means. Uh, but you don't have to do all of the sort of taxing things of trying to optimize it and, and actually targeting specific hardware. Um, LLVM looks after all of that for you. And um, so one of the ideas was just to use this intermediate representation or IR from LLVM, which in principle at least is not um, architecture specific. And the problem with that is that um, it's not designed to be um, architecture independent. Some architecture, there are, there are particular um, IR um, um, opcodes or sort of IR um, fragments that are um, kind of particular to some architectures. Um, and it becomes quickly a, um, a fairly problematic um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, platform to try and build on. Um, so one or two of the other things, we could have tried to use EVM, but again, EVM is really not designed for this kind of general um, specification of state transition functions of validity. Um, I mean, it's barely even um, um, sort of uh, well uh, well designed for smart contracts. I mean, at the time, you know, when so EVM actually, um, it was me who gave it the EVM name before I came along, um, sort of in the original incarnation of Vitalik's white paper, it's called EtherScript. Um, and it was really meant to be a scripting language. It was, you know, some of the early EtherScripts um, were written literally as just like Bitcoin script. So just like the, the mnemonic and then any of the arguments to the mnemonic. Um, so it looked kind of like assembly, kind of macro assembly. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of came along was like, well, this is, this is pretty low level. I don't think, you know, having it, calling it a script is, is sensible at all. So I sort of came along with this kind of notion of the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, but it is reasonably low level, but it has some fairly high level aspects to it. Um, where it sort of deviates significantly from common hardware. One of the obvious ones is the 256-bit word size. So the stack and the, the memory is done, or the, the storage at least, is done in terms of 256-bit words. And, uh, you know, that, that basically means that almost all low-level code um, is, is massively suboptimal because it's all being stored in these, you know, huge heap-allocated... Um, uh, chunks of memory, even though only one or two bytes of them are, are, are being used. So we um, we kind of ditched that idea pretty quickly. I mean, I don't think it was ever really given an afterthought. Um, and was there another one? Oh yeah, there was one other possibility that, that we mooted, and that was targeting it to a particular hardware, but um, a particular hardware, um, sort of CPU architecture. Uh, but one that was sufficiently kind of risk enough. So uh, reduced instruction set computers, what risk stands for. And the idea is that it's it's not got very many opcodes. It's very simple. So in principle, you can retarget it. You can recompile it into a uh, into a sort of a, another architecture without losing too much um, performance. Uh, and the obvious one was ARM. Uh, the ARM uh, targeting something like ARM v5. Um, uh, but again, we we sort of Having thought about it a bit a bit more, we kind of figured, yeah, probably, probably not the way to go, especially when we have something like WebAssembly, which is increasingly supported by the, you know outfits like Google and uh, and Mozilla. It's it's very much likely to end up with uh, you know really well performing compilers um, that transcompile it from WebAssembly into the native um, uh, native architecture. Um, LLVM targets it natively, um, so it doesn't. You know, it's it's basically as good as um, as as something hardware like ARM, except it's um, it's going to be uh, probably much better supported, and it's also simpler. It's easier to um, um, to work with. Um, you've got various tool bits of tooling that let you do programs um, uh, very easily. You've got functions as a as a sort of initial uh, as a sort of a primary. Thing getting imports and exports, it's basically designed to be developable, developable rather than uh, designed to be um, implemented on on fast hardware. And so, um, yeah, we we figured it was probably the best choice, and, and certainly in terms of um, its its future, um, um, definitely the best choice.
Hiring is stressful. Let's face it, it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm Start On Chain and his Time Locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity Blockchain Hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Radek for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no risk trial. A TopTal director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. At this point, you've, you've basically covered a big key insight, and that key insight is so Polkadot are gonna, is going to have all of these heterogeneous chains. Now you can think of like each chain has its own individual DNA. It's specialized to do something unique, which others are not. And so you want a way to express the individuality, the individual DNA of each chain in some like common way. And what Polkadot is doing is, is saying that the individuality of each chain is its state transition function, which is here's, here's the current state of the ledger. In comes a set of transactions or events. And there's a function that will take it from the old state of the ledger to the new state of the ledger. If you could represent the differing state transition functions of all of these heterogeneous chains in one common way, that would be nice. And then Polkadot ended up picking up the WASM standard to express all of the state transition functions in one common way. Cool. So like, it makes sense, right? So we have come to this piece of the story. And now, of course, this piece of the story ultimately leads into substrate, doesn't it? Um, so just tell us what is Substrate and how you're using this insight to build Substrate. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> what is Substrate? So um, Substrate's many things. Substrate began as um, a desire to abstract out the common bits um, of, uh, of Polkadot um, that could also be used for building other chains like you know we were doing from the from the the ground up we were building this kind of um this software stack for polka dot and i really hate seeing code not be able to be reused it's kind of like you know food waste it's like come on you know someone can eat this food surely <laughs> i don't i don't like throwing it away um i prefer to put it in a tupperware and uh, and save it for later and there's kind of Tupperware food is a little bit like um, abstracting code. Um, you can, um, if you if you turn it into a module uh, ready for reuse, then it means someone else can eat it later. Um, and it also kind of, it, it's, it's actually just generally good practice. There's a lot, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, if you put force, if you sort of modularize your code, then it also makes it, it makes it generic, which means that you have to be much more um, clear about what the interfaces are. You need to be much more clear about the definitions. If you're trying to get other people to use it, it means that they're going to help maintain it. It means that they have a stake in, in, in your code base, which means that you know that they might end up fixing some bugs or at least being um, at least catching some bugs. Um, it builds community. Um, it, it means that you know your documentation is probably going to be a lot better uh, because you're now having to document for external people rather than just internal people, and that means that. As your internal people change, um, as pe more people come on, it's much easier for them to uh, to get to grips with it. Um, so you know, there's just huge numbers of reasons why it's really sensible to you know abstract and modularize your code and get it to the point where it can be used for multiple projects, internal and external. And that's that's kind of where Substrate came from. Um, 
if you look at Substrate's heritage, it, it you know it wasn't a thing initially. It was just Polkadot, and and you know over time, it's like there was a, at one point like I did a giant rename and and sort of many of the Polkadot modules became Substrate modules, and then there was sort of continual refactorings to take the to take much of the Polkadot code and turn it into generic code within Substrate, and then eventually the repository split out, and we have now a separate Substrate repository. Um, now we always knew that building chains in Polkadot, so we call these chains parachains because they're like kind of either parallelized chains or they're kind of like chains but not exactly like chains. Um, and we always knew that there's going to be some sort of SDK uh, to be able to, you know, we needed that sort of thing to be able to build more of these chains and sort of hurry things up. Um, and Substrate, uh, it turns out, is uh, not only very good for uh, you know sort of building the Polkadot relay chain, the sort of big chain in the middle, um, and building other chains um, that have nothing to do with Polkadot, but it's also uh, good for uh, building these parachains. It, it has much of the sorts of um, um, algorithms um, and subroutines that you need uh, for building parachains, things like syncing the chain, things like peer networking. And Although that's not finished yet, uh, we're still very much working on sort of on that aspect of Substrate. Um, it, it fits very nicely into the design of Substrate. Um, so Substrate is really a blockchain framework. It's, 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 if you like, Substrate's actual reason is um, to be the antithesis of blockchain maximalism, right? So Substrate is probably the world's biggest bet against blockchain maximalism. It's, uh, you know, the whole point of Substrate is to make making new chains really, 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 really easy. Like as easy as building smart contracts almost. The idea is that you you just pick and choose which bits you want. Um, there's a, maybe even a library of, of, of modules that you, can, um, that you can choose from. You select the consensus mechanism you want um, and you end up with, uh, you know, with a a chain that's as good as, as as good as if not better than one that you would um, uh, have hand built yourself. Now the idea is that these consensus mechanisms that you can choose from, we've already implemented a few of them. So there was um, uh, our PBFT derived um, uh, sort of uh, uh, consensus thing called uh, Rhododendron, um, and that's that's fairly similar to Tendermint that the Cosmos guys are using. Um, we also uh, have now Aura implemented and a deriv derivative of Aura called Auram, which basically just introduces shuffling to the um, to the authorities. Um, and uh, one of the things that's sort of being um, uh, actively merged at the moment is the grandpa uh, algorithm. I, I call it Shaft actually, so it's like kind of Shaft, sometimes called Shaft, sometimes called Grandpa. Um, I forget what Grandpa stands for, but Shaft stands for Shared Ancestry Finality Tool. And this is a, uh, a new um, consensus algorithm that we uh, came up with. I should say that the Web3 Foundations research team um, came up with, uh, sort of in concert with, with uh, Parity, and particularly um, uh, Rob at Parity. And uh, I guess we can talk about that a bit later. But it's one of the sort of things that you can pick, one of the consensus algorithms that you can pick. And the idea is eventually to have a, uh, another consensus algorithm called Parachain or Polkadot that lets you form consensus based around um, uh, using uh, the Polkadot relay chain as your um, as your sort of uh, mechanism. Um, and what this means is that um, if you can code your chain in Substrate now, then it means your chain will be able to be um, integrated into Polkadot later. Um, the other really nice thing about it is that it uh, both the consensus algorithm and the runtime. So the runtime is what we call the state transition function, or the, the sort of nature of the network, the thing that interprets the transactions, executes the blocks. It's what makes Ethereum Ethereum and Bitcoin Bitcoin. And um, the idea is that these can all be hot swapped. They're all pluggable, but not just pluggable. They can actually be changed in situ as the chain is, is ongoing. So you can switch between consensus algorithms even. You can move it from being a uh, a chain that's sort of busy going along on its own to one that's integrated into the polka dot. You can change it from a, um, a rhododendron PBFT style chain into a grandpa chain, onto a, into a, even a proof of work chain. You can just switch between, um, switch between them as you choose. And 
The, um, the same can be said about the runtime. So you can actually take your chain and, and just turn it from a Bitcoin into an Ethereum chain. I mean, you have to define exactly how that would work with the accounts and stuff. But basically, if you can imagine it, if you can code it, then it can be done. And um, that's massively different to um, the current generation of blockchains and actually even most of the next generation blockchains um, that have what, what we would call in the graphics industry a fixed function pipeline. They're kind of fixed function chains because you have to go back to the sort of, um, I mean, basically they're not designed to ever change. Um, we see this in Bitcoin that's sort of terminally not designed to ever change. Um, but we also see a lot of it in Ethereum where, you know, it was never designed to be upgraded. Um, so in order to upgrade it, you, you basically all of your users, everybody that's ever using Ethereum has to opt into the change. And if they don't, then they're going to just run off into, um, uh, you know, on the, on the sort of uh, continue and the old version of the chain and um, they'll come out of consensus. Yeah, so that, that was super fascinating what you talked about how substrate works in this way. So let me just sort of rephrase it to, to see if I understood it correctly, right? So you have substrate, this like framework for uh, developing a blockchain. Now, somebody could go today or today or maybe in a few months, but like, you know, in the very near future and say, or, or maybe today and, and build this, you know, substrate blockchain. And now they could use, for example, the, the existing, uh, consensus algorithms you have, you know, maybe grandpa or maybe that your tenement like algorithm or, you know, something that exists today, they launch this blockchain and now, uh, you know, a year from now or something like that, uh, Polkadot launches and then that chain could actually decide to, you know, on the live chain say, okay, we're going to swap out the consensus and we're going to start using Polkadot consensus and rely and you know, we get rid of our own validators and we rely on the security off the relay chain is this this would really be uh, possible yeah that's right so that's the sort of use case we're designing for um so yeah uh, you know the pretty much all of the existing consensus algorithms require you to name validators um either you know hard code them or more likely that we have proof of stake systems um but in all of these instances you do need to incentivize them not to misbehave um, usually through slashing, so if they lose some of their stake, if they um, do anything bad. Um, and the idea is that eventually you'll basically just be able to uh, move it to Polkadot with little more than a, um, a single sort of change in the um, uh, in the chain sort of runtime itself. So you, it's like literally a storage item. You basically just say, yeah, uh, change this particular bit of storage from um, using grandpa or rhododendron or whatever the consensus algorithm that the chain is using is to um, use parachain. And we want to use parachain slot 42. It's like, right, it's cool. And as long as Polkadot is expecting, is expecting you, then um, it will just seamlessly switch over. Yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely mind blowing. So I'm, I'm super excited to see how that's going to turn out. And uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are certainly developing some very interesting uh, technology there. So of course, like Substrate is is very ambitious, and so where where is it currently at? As far as I'm aware, your sub, your plan is to like releasing Ethereum, release a series of POCs, each with more complexity over over the previous one, until you have the final Substrate. So what's the current POC, and what can it do? So we haven't actually made any release of um, our our. Schedule is to release our beta, 1.0 beta of Substrate um, real soon now, like before the, uh, ideally before the Web3 Summit. So that's like in a few days time. Um, it's certainly, um, it's certainly, you know, most of the code has been written. It's now just a case of, of merging it and um, and testing it. So. I'm pretty uh, pretty happy to sort of claim that this is going to be out within the next week or so. The 1.0 beta sort of has enough for um, doing fairly general um, chain development. So it will have the uh, rhododendron consensus algorithm in, the instant finality one that's a bit like Tendermint. It will have the uh, grandpa 
a, a finality um, algorithm in that's, uh, I don't know if we can talk about it later or whatever, uh, but it's our sort of uh, new cool uh, consensus sort of algorithm. It's a, an iteration uh, or two beyond um, um, uh, beyond a, a rhododendron. And it's um, it has some stuff in common with the Ethereum 2.0 consensus algorithm. It's, it takes a slightly different road, but um, uh, but it's a basically a progressive finality thing. So um, we also have the Orand um, uh, block production um, algorithm um, in for 1.0 beta, um, and we have um, a. Uh, we will likely for 1.0 have a um, an iteration on that that's um, sort of derived probably from uh, a Ruberos. Uh, which is a kind of slightly, um, it's it's actually got quite a lot of similarity with Oran, but it's um, a little bit, um, it, it's it's basically been demonstrated secure as long as a few particular guarantees are, are given. So um, that's likely to be our um, sort of final iteration for consensus on Substrate and Polkadot. Um, 1.0 beta will have mostly finalized APIs. Um, the beta is most is, is primarily there because firstly it hasn't yet been audited. Uh, that's something that we are looking into, um, and it hasn't. Uh, the documentation is still a work in progress. Um, but over this period of the next two or three months, as 1.0 beta becomes 1.0, um, we'll be um, sort of uh, working a lot more on the tutorials. Um, there may be some minor API tweaks. Um, but uh, yeah, by and large, um, what you see with 1.0, you'll be uh, what you develop on, on 1.0 will be um, usable um, for the foreseeable future. Great. So, so we, we spoke before, right, about this power of of this on-chain automated upgrades, and and it obviously is amazing, or, or you know, super interesting. But of course, power it has it has two sides, right? So it, today, when you have a, an upgrade of you know a significant consensus affecting upgrade of a blockchain, you know, in general have a hard fork, right? So there's this big discussion around it, and then you know this hard fork happens. People actively that want to fool them, but they have to download the new client, and you know to the extent that people and miners actually use that client also determines whether that change gets accepted. So here. We have, uh, you know, basically these automatic updates, right? Where I don't have to upgrade the client. So, so first of all, what's what is the the big downside with hard forks, and how does that? Uh, how do you still have this level of accountability or control, or, or does this lead to a lot of risks as well? Having you know automated upgrades. Um, so I think it's it's fair to say that um, automated upgrades are kind of like a sharp knife, you know. You, uh, they're very powerful. You got to be, uh, you got to be sure that when you use them as part of your chain definition, um, there are an appropriate amount of safeguards uh, in place to um, to be sure that they can't be used um, malevolently and they can't accidentally be um, sort of misused um, because they have the power to brick your chain, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I demonstrated on the first on-chain upgrade uh, last April in EdCon. But because they're powerful doesn't mean that we shouldn't do them. It just means that we should develop appropriate safeguards to make sure that you know, when they're used, they're only used when we sort of expect them to be used. Um, most technologies, most disruptive technologies are powerful um, and there's inevitably sort of a bit of an outcry from the side saying, especially the sides that are in some sense staked in the current technology to say, oh, this is, this is very dangerous, very powerful. Ooh, you probably don't want to do that, you know. Um, and it's like, no, no, no. You know, when you're pushing the fold, you are developing these things, and they are, um, they are to some degree um, um, you know, dangerous. Sharp knives <laughs> are dangerous, but it's still a chef will prefer to work with a sharp knife than a blunt knife. Um, in the case of uh, blockchain upgrades. Upgrade paths for software are very, very important, especially in the early days, and especially when you have so much economic inertia behind them. We can see this with Bitcoin. Uh, there are many sort of follow-ups to Bitcoin that are better in various ways, and yet the money is still behind Bitcoin. 
Um, and that, you know, that's kind of problematic because Bitcoin hasn't got an upgrade path. There is no really easy way of upgrading Bitcoin. Um, why is it problematic specifically? Well, hard forks are generally considered um, mutations of a blockchain. And as such, their blockchain being something that, you know, a lot of a lot of people in the blockchain think, uh, you know, immutability, this idea that a blockchain is well defined and it should never move beyond the confines of that initial uh, definition, um, are forever at odds with those that believe blockchain should, um, you know, should evolve. Um, so which means every time a hard fork is proposed, unless you have someone that basically everyone can rally behind to say, fine, this is a dictator, they dictate that it changes, um, then you're stuck with a big problem of how do you decide when the upgrade is necessary enough um, that everybody should switch onto the heart onto the new uh, the new chain and they should all indeed do this uh, procedure that you demo that you that you just described and upgrade their software and all the rest of it and that decision that uh, that mechanism for, for for sort of globally deciding this in a decentralized uh, uh, manner. Uh, and particularly one that's full of people that you know actually don't really trust anyone else because that's why they're in this. You know, it's a very self-selecting ecosystem, the uh, trustless or trust-free ecosystem. You know, basically full of people that don't really trust anyone else. Um, it becomes very difficult to to agree, you know, um, which is ironic because the technology that we have here is technology. Uh, for making agreements, right? That's what consensus is. <laughs> so so we're, we're stuck in this ecosystem where, you know, the key differentiator from the rest of the world is that we're all about consensus technology and uh, we can't form a consensus on when to upgrade our consensus technology. <laughs> um, the whole thing, you know, smacks of a bit of a, a, a Shakespearean uh, uh, comedy. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is that we, we have, we extend our consensus technology to, um, to dictate not just what happens on the chain, but what happens with the chain itself. Um, and this isn't a crazy idea. This isn't something that, you know, is like, oh, 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 that's, that's, that's so different to what we're doing. It's exactly the same as what we've been doing already. Um, the only difference is that um, we're sort of extending it a level up and we're saying, well, look, you know, there's, there's very important things that happen on the chain, you know, potentially huge balance transfers, well, things like the DAO where, you know, you've got a smart contract that's controlling tens, hundreds of millions and it's, um, and it's flawed in some way. Um, well, we're, we're just sort of saying, well, yeah, we, we recognize that sensitive software exists on the chain. We also recognize that the chain itself is sensitive software. So just as much as the uh, things that happen on the chain are controlled by algorithms that have un underlying, usually they have some sort of governance structure, even if it's like there's one guy and he holds the key. Um, a lot of them are, are, are you know, much more uh, complex than that in multi-sig wallets and all the rest of it. Um, well, let's let's apply a similar governance structure, perhaps something that's even more sophisticated, um, to make similar decisions. But these decisions are about the chain. And if you understand the sort of technical, the, the sort of technical implementation of of um, protocols like Substrate that allow this kind of um, this kind of upgrade to happen, um, you realize that Substrate is actually just a meta version of Ethereum. All we're doing really is we're saying rather than have a smart contract that dictates a particular state transition function, we're saying that there's actually just a single runtime that is the chain uh, and that dictates uh, a state transition function. And just as a smart contract can say, um, I, instead of running this code, I want you to from the next block run this other code. That's all that we're saying with the with with uh, with, with with substrate. It's like from this point onwards, I'd prefer you to run rather than the code that's running at the moment. You should run this other code. It's really just a case of extending the the software um, uh, model of a smart contract one stage higher uh, and and taking it onto the, the blockchain level. So really, the only uh, question that's left. I mean, I don't I don't see upgradability as any kind of a controversial thing. Um, yes, it's powerful, but so are smart contracts. So is the fact that you can control money without having recourse to an organization based purely on an algorithm. It's really fucking powerful. Um, it's fine. We're, we're in this, we're all here because we, we recognize the power and we think it's probably a good thing for the world. So with the, with the on-chain upgradability, the question simply becomes, um, what are the specifics behind taking the decision to upgrade the chain 
Um, and how do we, you know, how do we ensure that it's, uh, you know, it has appropriate fail safes in? Now, of course, Vitalik and Vlad uh, and a bunch of the Ethereum people have sort of argued that, you know, uh, you know, smart contracts is great, but then the governance process, it's better if that takes place off chain and if people can even have this like social consensus. And, and I, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. I think there's probably a fear of, you know, the riskiness of, of on chain governance and, you know, the power, as you phrase it. Uh, I think another big concern is that if you do have an on-chain process, then you know what is that process controlled with? And you know, generally it would be the token holders, right? Because that's kind of the the the, the basic you know unit of significance, right? In in a blockchain system, since you, you don't really have you know real world identities there. And then there's this fear that it will you know be blockocracy and controlled by the small group of token holders. So what 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 is your view of, of of kind of you know both of those concerns? If we go back to basics about what blo what blockchain is about, it's about a trust free decentralized means of following specific processes. It's about taking the risk and uncertainty um, from how a system will behave. Um, for Bitcoin, that system was currency and payments. Um, it was taking the risk and uncertainty out of having your assets seized and about how much it would cost to transfer those assets. For Ethereum, it's much more abstract. It has smart contracts. But it, in essence, it's taking the risk and uncertainty out of particular business processes um, that smart contracts can encode. It's all about taking well-defined processes and removing the risk and uncertainty that will be executed as you expect. Governance of a blockchain is a process. If it's not a process, it's arbitrary and probably random. It will only work effectively if it's a process. On-chain governance is simply the effective execution of that process. It's a well-defined, formally defined, strictly defined um, uh, process and it will be executed as you expect, as everybody expects. The notion that you can, that in some sense it's better to either not have a process or have a vague process that's vaguely followed by people vaguely commenting on social media and getting together in vague groups and vaguely coming to some vague decision the, the thought that that is better than having a well-defined, strict process that's executed correctly is absolutely nonsensical. It's the most stupid thing that Vitalik has ever said. And I can't believe anyone could possibly believe it. Yes, it is a powerful thing. Yes, there need to be safeguards. Yes, the processes need to be properly designed. But none of that means that it should be done off-chain. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that there's something very ironic and strange to say, on the one hand, we need to use smart contract and have this, you know, trustlessness and control and, and auditability, but not when it comes to managing the system itself. So I, I think that's a completely fair point. However, then there's the question of, you know, how is that process managed? Let's say we accept that it, sh it will be desirable to have it, uh, you know, properly structured and, and as a, as a, auditable you know process then there's still this concern around you know maybe a small minority of token holders uh controlling it and you know in in the case of of polkadot right the uh, i mean i don't know what the distribution of tokens will will look like in the future but um at the, the token during the fundraiser i think it was around 50 percent that were you know either the parity or or the foundation so of course that does raise the question, if it is explicit process and if the token holders are the ones that determine it, like how do you then also get, uh, you know, a kind of wide support or is that something that matters? Um, so I'd, I'd prefix this answer with um, a couple of points. The first is that Bitcoin is essentially controlled by Bitcoin Core and seven or eight miners, maybe a few exchanges. 
Ethereum, if it wants to do a hard fork, is a dictatorship. If Vitalik states this is the way Ethereum should hard fork, ETH will hard fork that way. Ethereum Foundation has a trademark, Vitalik controls the Ethereum Foundation. Um, it's as simple as that. So the governance processes <laughs> for the major two, the top two cryptocurrencies are um, Pluto plutocracy slash oligarchy and dictatorship. <laughs> So I reckon we're doing pretty well if we have stakeholder voting already. But that aside, yes, um, the uh, there's uh, there's actually only thirty percent that that was um, um, that will be with the Web three Foundation on um, uh, on the launch of Polkadot. So although fifty percent was sold in the original sale, um, twenty percent will be distributed one way or another. Um, probably through a few sales and possibly an airdrop um, before uh, before launch. Um, so that that means that over two thirds will be in the hands of the many, so to speak. Um, and actually, uh, the foundation will be giving away about ten percent of its um, tokens to various people that have um, uh, that have helped, you know, sort of build it and found it, and, and community members, hackathons. Um, all all of that kind of um, um, uh, crowd, and then. Um, Another probably ten percent ish will go to um, the uh, teams behind the implementations. Um, at the moment, that's primarily parity, but the idea is to find some other teams as well. So there won't actually be more than ten percent held by any individual um, actor um, at the time of launch, and that's still a fairly sizable chunk, admittedly. But it's you know far beyond the the uh, far below the amount that would be required to um, uh, to actually push through um, arbitrary changes to the chain. Um, beyond that, um, I, I absolutely agree with many of the concerns um, that, uh, you know, that are brought up by people like Vitalik and Vlad over um, stakeholder um, voting, which is partly why we don't have a strict, um, you know, just coin vote uh, model for Polkadot. It's uh, even at its current state, and this is I, you know, this is meant to iterate, you know, before release and even after release. Um, we don't have a straight sort of um, um, coin holder voting um, per se. It's rather um, we do have a, an adage, a sort of maxim, which is if more than fifty percent of the of the coin holders of the coins vote to make a change, then the change is made. That just seems to me to be an economically sensible thing because if if you don't listen to the majority of our coin holders, if actually 51% vote in a particular way, you know, that's such a sizable majority that they could probably fork it and just go along with a new fork anyway. And then you'd be left with like a minority uh, of the chain or of the chain stake staying on the original fork. And that, that, just, that just seems crazy. So it's like, you know, having a maxim whereby 51% of the stake, so not 51% of the turnout, critically, 51% of the stake can choose to sort of um, can of choose to evolve the chain. That just seems like a self um, a, a case of self uh, uh, managing uh, continued self existence, um, self preservation, I should say. Um, beyond that, we have something that's much more um, uh, sort of adaptive. Um, there's a sort of a, a, a council which is this notion of uh, uh, of, of a body that, that is brought in through uh, th um, approval voting and you know kind of help um, the idea is that through kind of deferring to um, uh, to a, a smaller set of people they can probably um, uh, bring about sort of sensible changes or at least propose sensible changes um, uh, to the chain that that allow some degree of, of fast movingness without we're still with a democratic safeguard or a safeguard that's sort of um, coin democratic now beyond that i still I, i'm not you know this is a, a first effort i don't think this is going to be a uh, i don't think this is going to be the final thing uh, but it's it's somewhere on the path to um something sensible a sensible way of governing a chain um, beyond that, I do think there's all sorts of interesting avenues to go down, and these are things that we'll be prototyping in Polkadot on the way to release, and that we'll be continuing to prototype beyond release. So some of the sort of ideas um, have, have come up. So uh, one of the things that uh, Vitalik mentioned was quadratic voting, which is basically where um, as you skip votes, 
um, your votes become worth um, quadratically more um, when you do eventually choose to vote. So um, it's a bit useless without um, uh, without some form of uh, um, uh, civil resistance, um, but it's um, it's not in principle. If you did have if you did have this civil resistance resistance, then it would be um, it would become um, uh, pretty interesting. Beyond that, there's also the idea that uh, you don't vote with coins. Um, instead, you vote with um, uh, coins that have been locked. So essentially, um, when you go to vote, your vote is how long you, you will lock your coins for if your, your side of the vote turns out to win. So it's like, I think this is a really good upgrade, or I think this is a, a sensible rescue, um, and I'm backing it with my money, because if it turns out not to be a sensible rescue and the price drops, then I'm locked in for that price drop, and everyone else that voted against it gets to sell their, their, their dot tokens or whatever, their currency, um, um, uh, and then buy back if the price rises, if you do another referendum in order to you know, undo the damage or whatever it'll be. So there's a notion of like economic motivation. When you get economic motivation, it becomes much more like a market mechanism, uh, much more um, where people have to put the money where their mouth is, and and you end up with something less like a uh, something that, that that follows less the flaws of a democracy and more um, the um, um, the triumphs of the market. In addition to that, there's all sorts of potential like future uh, futurey sort of mechanisms where people can sort of bet. Um, on uh, on uh, you know on, on price going up and down and, and um, based upon proposals and we've got a few other ideas that are sort of sitting on the back burner about how that might work. Um, all in all, I think um, I've, oh yeah, one of the other things I should mention um, is uh, the idea of like having not using coins as the purely a way of of deciding. Um, who should be voting for what, or whose opinion should matter, but also using, um, you know, positioning community potentially even um, this a, a notion of like uh, there being a body that decides uh, who are DAP um, uh, authors, or maybe uh, parachains are able to um, uh, have votes, have a you know a vote as part of their. Uh, a part of the, the the sort of notion of being a parachain. So the parachains each have their own individual governance mechanisms that allow their users in order to influence what happens on the relay chain. Um, there's also an idea of having uh, voting through transaction fees. So whenever you um, issue a transaction on the relay chain, um, you can um, put in a vote, or you can uh, your account at least gets a little bit more um, uh, voting power. Um, so there's quite a few. Um, there's quite a few ideas floating around as to how to make it not purely um, a coin vote thing. Some of these are things that we've implemented, like the council. Um, others are things that we definitely plan on implementing, like um, coin lock-ins for vote. And, um, and, and others are the things that, things that sort of definitely deserve further research. Um, to see if we can uh, if we can come up with a, a reason as to why they would work and, and, and you know, push forward with implementation if we think that they're promising. Yeah, no, I think this is a good point. And uh, like very much on this topic, so we, we did have a few weeks ago, we, we did an interview with Arthur and Kathleen from, from Tezos. And, and, you know, he kind of made a similar point, right? This question was like, okay, the, the goal of governance in Tezos isn't to like, you know, replicate a democracy. It's to basically build an efficient blockchain. Uh, and so I think if you look at it at that way, uh, maybe coin voting is less offensive. I think if you look at it, coming from the perspective of like you being used to like the system of democracy, right? That manages this environment that people function in. Then I think people get very upset, right? And if you're like, okay, this is not a good, good system. And I think of course, also one of the big benefits of especially proof of stake blockchains is if people don't like it, it's really easy to fork, right? And it's really easy to launch a new network and have, you know, different distribution of token holders and get rid of the ones you don't like. So I think that also provides this like very powerful kind of balance where, okay, maybe a majority of coin voters could you know decide in something in some uh, you know way that serves them specifically, but if they end up losing the user base because they decide to fork the chain, then like that's also a very kind of powerful uh, balance of power that you know you don't have an existing political system, right? You can't just say, okay, I'm going to fork this country and go my own way. Yeah, I mean. Uh... 
you know, there are certainly separatist movements that that uh, kind of would quite like to fork countries, but um, yeah, it's it's certainly a lot harder. And I mean, one of the um, one of the things that we're not implementing, certainly not for a year or two, uh, but vague ideas that, that I've had was was actually to make forking the network part of the governance system. So basically, when a when a vote happens, um, you can say, well, or a, min a minority can say, we really don't want this to go in, like to the point where we will um, destroy our account balances on this chain and um, fork the chain into a new chain where you guys don't get your account balances, but we get ours. So basically, you actually um, you actually do a split, um, and that that that's for balances as well. And the idea is, if we can make this a um, if we can make this a sort of sufficiently trivial operation, so that things you know things like exchanges can automatically kind of list these extra tokens, you know, when it splits, so that there's automatically a means of deciding who gets what name and who gets you know some derivative name, or even like automatically determining the derivative name, um, that would potentially lead to fewer splits because it's like um, the majority would actually believe the minorities, like they couldn't help but believe the minorities' um, uh, uh, threats because the minority would be held to it. Basically, they, their balances would get wiped if uh, you know if, if the vote go if the vote went through with the majority. And because they can make these credible threats, you can also build into the governance system uh, more credible minority um, uh, minority uh, uh, sort of support. By saying, well, if if you're willing to like put all of your coins up in order to in order to say you know no in order to try and veto it, then we will listen to the veto. We'll say, well, this vote this vote actually got vetoed. Um, it won't go through. It can be revoted again, maybe in a month or in two months or something. Uh, but you know, it, it's enough um, for them to um, uh, to basically say. You need to think about this some more, guys, because you know this is a this is a credible threat, and the, the the chain will fork otherwise. And I mean, this is similar to the bicameral system in the UK, where you've got the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Lords can't indefinitely um, uh, block a vote by the House of Commons, but they can send it back to the Commons um, a handful of times in order to say, look, we really don't think this is a great idea. You guys need to kind of reconsider this. Um, and I, I think these more sophisticated systems, particularly ones that play on time, uh, that, that say, well, you know, it's not to say we'll block it forever. It's not to say that, you know, you know, a sufficient majority of turnout will, will, um, uh, will always win. It's rather to say that um, sometimes you just need to think of it more and you can come to some sort of, um, uh, some sort of compromise where both sides are happy. Great. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I'm really curious to see all the governance experiments that will happen on Polkadot. The other thing, of course, is when you have so many different parachains, experiments and governance can happen on these parachains. So um, we can iterate our way towards better governing these systems over time. Yeah, so parachains um, basically have a similar, I mean, they all run on substrate, so they have similar mechanisms to um, uh, indeed to the relay chain in order to um, govern themselves, in order to upgrade themselves, and uh, that's kind of that's very much. I, I quite like um, one of the things that the U.S.'s federal system is is kind of cool um, is this idea that states can have various different um, kind of social um, economics. They can have different welfare systems. Um, they can experiment with like different medical care systems. I think um, uh, notably, was it Michigan that had a, a version of Obamacare before Obama uh, brought it in? And it was, uh, who was he? It was Obama, one of Obama's challenges that was actually the governor of Michigan that brought in that 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 healthcare system, and obviously later said, "Oh no, I, I you know, I don't." No, it was I don't Massachusetts. Think yeah, yeah, oh, it, Massachusetts. Was it, it was the the what was Mitt Romney. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mitt Romney, exactly. So the the idea that you know you can have two states next to each other, like Texas and California, that have um, you know vastly different um, welfare systems, um, uh, taxation systems, and all the rest of it, basically governance systems, is 
um, is really great because the, the things that work can be rolled out nationwide and the ones that don't, at least it's only a state that's kind of um, uh, got a failed experiment on its hands. And I see the same thing happening with Polkadot where you know each of the different parachains and their communities can experiment with their various governance systems and the things that work get rolled out to Polkadot and the things that don't, well, they stay on the parachain. Cool. So that brings us to the last theme, which is Polkadot is a very ambitious project, right? So you have new consensus mechanisms, you have substrate to build parachains, you have interchain communication. There's a lot you need to get right in order to launch the system and have it be a like a, be a fruitful ecosystem. So where where is the project currently at in its life cycle? What works well and what doesn't? And when can we expect to see a release of the mainnet? So Polkadot itself is, um, we released POC2. POC2 was actually an on-chain upgrade from POC1. That was the first, to my knowledge, on-chain upgrade of a um, sort of live network, um, a live public test net. And uh, yeah, I mean, and it was also, a, it wasn't just a, a, you know, a sort of flaky, uh, sort of demo where you've just got like one minor irrelevant thing that's been upgraded. This was like a full uh, runtime upgrade. It, it, like huge amounts of things changed. Um, all of the front ends had to change to deal with the new runtime. This was actually a legitimate um, alter, you know, completely new test net. Um, it's just that it happened to have the historical POC1 blocks before it. Um, and all the POC1 um, substrates or polka dot um, could, um, could continue syncing. Okay, so um, POC2 is out. Uh, POC3 is right around the corner. Um, it's finished, as I said, except for this um, uh, this extra consensus algorithm, which will probably be our um, final Polkadot consensus algorithm. Pretty excited about that. Um, and uh, yeah, it should be kind of interesting to see. Um, POC4 was scheduled for uh, late in the year, sort of New Year time. Um, we're probably a couple weeks behind on POC3, so I would guess uh, we're looking more like um, late January 20, um, 2019. And POC4 basically takes Polkadot to um, feature completeness. It, um, it introduces the interchain communication and it will have a um, relatively um, sophisticated consensus mechanism um, in order to um, you know, bring in the parachain blocks, it will have the validation, the fishermen, and the collators. Um, actually, we already have collators. We already did the parachain thing in POC2. So there's actually, I don't know if there's already a parachain deployed. Certainly, there have been parachains deployed on, test, on uh, closed test nets. Um, the idea with POC5 is to bring in the substrate um, executable itself as a parachain collation system so that basically we can start running. Um, things like smart contract chains, potentially Bitcoin, um, a Bitcoin chain and a UTXO chain on um, on the testnet, on the POC, whatever it would be, four or five testnet. And um, and also start playing around with pluggable consensus and hot swappable consensus and, and all the rest of it. So um, that's likely to be done uh, around April uh, 2019. Um, at that point, um, basically we'll switch to smaller POCs and the audit will happen, um, um, will we'll begin. So the components that are fixed, things like the consensus algorithm, the WASM interpreter and a few other bits, um, will start audited probably, start being audited probably towards the end of this year. And the auditing will be going on um, sort of in the background. And as more and more gets sorted, it'll just sort of flow into the audit. Um, I would say we're still roughly on track for our original uh, release date of um, August twenty nine. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, autumn 20, um, uh, 2019, um, Probably be towards the end of Q three. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna eat these words. I know you know software projects are never <laughs> on time, but I'm gonna say them. There we are. Uh, end of twenty. End of uh, Q three twenty nineteen. We'll know more once POC4 is done. As I say, POC4 is basically feature completeness, and at that point, we're fairly, we'll be fairly happy about the protocol, and it's really just about getting the audits through. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Our SDK is 
basically substrate, and that's going to be continued to be developed. So that's um, parachain development can basically already be started. Um, and hopefully those parachains, those sorts of chains that are being developed in Substrate now can be deployed to Polkadot with relatively few code changes around maybe March time next year uh, for that for that Polkadot, Polkadot um, POC testnet. Um, yeah, but, you know, we are slowly um, getting to the point now where it's starting to feel um, quite real um, and, uh, and that's, that's encouraging. Cool. Well, Gavin, thank you so much for coming on. That was super fascinating to speak with you. And uh, I mean, uh, there's really a lot of very interesting things you're working on, a lot of great innovations. So yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's exciting and look forward to seeing how Polkadot develops and how it will do in the real world. Cool. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. And I look forward to coming back in another four years to uh, <laughs> yeah, chat about <laughs> what indeed did happen. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.